from our studios on Florida's Gulf Coast. This is Women of Grace Live. Join us today as we discuss issues important to your life and faith. Spiritual insight, compelling discussion, practical wisdom. Women of Grace, for such a time as this. Now, here's your host, Johnette Bankovic. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Women of Grace Live. I am Johnette Bankovic, and I'm thoroughly delighted to spend this time with you today. We've got all kinds of good things coming up for you in this period of time that God entrusts to us so that we can, in many ways, join together as the mystical body of Christ and make his face manifest, right, in this our day and time. So I do invite you to join us right here on Women of Grace Live. As you well know, it is a live broadcast. That means that we can accept your phone calls. That means that we can accept your text messages. That means that we can accept your questions, comments, insights, inspirations through social media as well. well. But let us begin with giving out some numbers today. If you would like to join us here, if you've got a question, we're happy about it. Just give us a call at 800-585-9396. That's 800-585-9396. That's the number to use if you are in North America. Again, I'll slow it down for you. It's 800-585-9396. If you're outside of North America, I've got a number for you too. I do. It begins with the country code. It's country code 1-205-271-2985. That's country code 1-205- 271 2985. Well, there's all kinds of things that are going on uh, upcoming. I'm very excited about many of them. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that this beautiful convocation is going to be taking place in Orlando, Florida, and it's beginning on July the 1st, which is this coming Saturday, and it's going all the way through until July 4th when it closes. And the purpose of this particular convocation is to bring together bishops of the church as well as delegates from their own individual dioceses and archdioceses. And additionally, people that are actively engaged in lay apostolate or lay ministry to discuss some of the pressing pressing issues that we're facing within our culture today. Uh, There was a convocation 100 years ago in 1917 uh, that took place right after the uh, First World War. And it was to discuss those issues and how it is that life gets back to normal and what is the church's role and how do we assist individuals at this moment in the history of man. And I I think in like fashion, so many of those issues are going to be discussed at this convocation. Plenary sessions will involve varieties of speakers uh, who will address a certain issue. And then the people that come are going to break up into discussion groups to delve a little bit more deeply into that which they heard, uh, strive to come up with some resolutions as well as uh, solve some of the problems that we face today and determine how is it that we, as the mystical body of Christ, uh, can be efficacious in helping people through this time and making the face of God present. Uh, About 4,000 people are expected to be in Orlando, and I want to let you know that you're going to have an opportunity to view some of this uh, as as, um, EWTN television is going to be there broadcasting and EWTN radio is going to be there broadcasting too. So I wanted to make you aware of that. You might set your schedules around that a little bit. I don't think you're going to want to miss what is taking place there. I know I'm not going to. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be there, and I will be hosting this event along with Jonathan Reyes from the USCCB. So please do pray for this event. Um, should have saved this, I think, for the bottom of the hour, but I'm giving it to you right up front here. Uh, we cer- certainly do ask for your prayers that this convocation will achieve the purposes that God has in mind for it. And speaking about that, it reminds us of the fact that each one of us is called to achieve the purpose for which God has in mind for us. I was thinking, um, you know, just recently about the fact that, you know, this God of ours intends to use us in dramatic ways. And he intends to use us in dramatic ways to the extent that we permit him to take up residence within us. And we've been talking about a number of things through the course of this week that involve that great reality. And we've been talking about the fact that we want to give over to our Lord Jesus Christ, all of those territories in our heart that need to be healed, all of those territories in our heart that need to come into a right understanding of who he is and who we are, of his love for us, of the way in which he wants to work in us and the way in which he wants to work through us. And um, 
I was reminded of something this morning. I had a lovely little conversation with one of my two daughters, and we were talking about the way in which it seems that, you know, God kind of brings people to us who might need to be reminded of the truths of the faith. You know, I don't know if you've experienced this, but I think that when we uh, seek to view the hand of God moving through the ordinary as well as the not so ordinary events of our lives, we often find that God is about a work that he wants to do through us in the lives of others. (coughs) This has been made apparent to me in recent months because I've been having some work being done here in my home due to a plumbing leak that I had. And it seems to me, and this is interesting, it doesn't seem to me, this is the fact of the matter. People come into the home, they see the uh, the religious symbols that I have in the home, they see statues of our Blessed Mother, crucifixes of our Lord Jesus Christ, they see images of St. Joseph, Uh, they see uh, artwork, you know, beautiful pictures. Uh, and, And so they come in and they look around And uh, they say, are you Catholic? (laughs) And I say, gee, what gave it away? (laughs) You know, and then they'll say, oh, you know, I was Catholic. And and three of the workers said to me, and I was an altar. You say that a lot of people, and I know that this will come up at this convocation, a lot of the people walk away from the faith because of misunderstandings that have taken place with a priest or with the lay faithful in a given community. And it just seems as though the default position is rather than trying to resolve this or was Catholic and they went to the church to say that they wanted to get married in the church and that they wanted to raise their children Catholic. But a woman from the community said, oh, you can't do that. She has to convert to Catholicism first. And rather than checking that further, this couple And the gentleman, specifically, walked away from the church and all these many years later still communicates that story. Well, let me put it into secular terms. That's very bad PR. Now, what does that indicate to me? Well, several things. All of this indicates several things. Number one, God wants to use us as purveyors of the truth, right? He wants us to be salesmen for Jesus Christ, indeed. He wants for us to be able to present him to others in loving and compassionate ways. Now, what does that involve? It involves that we know what the church teaches, that we don't make it up, and that we go through a process of education that goes beyond the eighth grade to find out what Holy Mother Church says about important issues that are taking place culturally, but also about the ordinary issues that take place in the life of man. And then we can communicate truth. Otherwise, we can be used by the evil one as an obstacle that prevents what she teaches. So I want to encourage you to pick up your catechisms, right? Pick them up. You know, just put them into your hand and don't just carry them around so that you look smart or something, but actually crack it open, open up the covers of the catechism and begin to read it and and go to the back in the index. The index is very helpful. I love you you that are watching. I'm holding this up. I don't know if you can see this exactly, but I am holding up and showing you the index in the back of the catechism of the Catholic Church. There's a a, a very full, well-documented index here that certainly does help for you uh, to help helps you to to discover what Holy Mother Church is saying about a variety of issues. And I got to tell you something, the ears of our heart, the ears of our mind have always got to be open. And I learn something new just about every single day in reference to our life of faith. I do. I listen to Catholic radio when I can. I turn on EWTN television when I can. I listen to uh, various kinds of offerings as I'm driving around in, in, my, in my truck or in my car. You know, I'm listening to uh, good apps when I'm making a, a long distance uh, a journey so that I am constantly feeding both my soul and my mind. So if you're not doing that, I really want to encourage you to do that, right? 
And, you know, perhaps you have a story to tell today where there was a misconception that occurred uh, or how you had a misunderstanding about what the church teaches and how that was rectified, you know, or if you question anything that the church teaches. I can't say I know the answers to all of it, but I know the answers to some of it, and I can promise you I'll research the rest. Uh, Perhaps we can talk about that today right here on Women of Grace Live. Again, those numbers, if you're outside of North America, you're going to use this number, country code 1-205-271-2985. If you're in North America, your number 800-585-9396. Again, that's 800-585-9396. We're looking forward to hearing from you right here on Women of Grace Live. We're going to go to a break. When we come back, more Around the Bend. Stay with us. It's the main event for us. We really enjoyed our family. I needed a place to pray. Which is not easy to find in our house. Yes, our hands are full, but our hearts are even fuller. They are families that have realized the importance of the Lord as the center of their family. A Lady of the Way. Praying as a Family, Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN-TV. Listen to EWTN Radio day or night. Audio on Demand brings you your favorite EWTN programs, prayers, and devotionals instantly to you for free. Visit EWTNapps.com and get started today. June 29th. Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, Apostles. St. Augustine wrote, Both apostles share the same feast day, for these two were one, and even though they suffered on different days, they were as one. Peter went first, and Paul followed. And so we celebrate this day made holy for us by the apostles' blood. Let us reflect on this meditation from morning prayer. God our Father, today you give us the joy of celebrating the feast of the apostles Peter and Paul. Through them your church received the faith. Keep us true to their teaching. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Saints Peter and Paul, pray for us and teach us to follow in your footsteps. Amen. If you'd like to receive a daily grace line by email, go to womenofgrace.com and click on the word grace line. Then click on the box receive grace lines. That's womenofgrace.com. Hello, this is Father John Paul Mary. This is Debbie Giorgiani, co-host of Take Two with Jerry and Debbie. My friends, this is Bishop Kevin Van of the Diocese of Orange. I want to thank you very much for listening to the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Welcome back, friends. I am so happy to be with you live here on Women of Grace today. Oh my gosh, I've got so many things going on in my mind all at the same time. Can you imagine such a thing? Different tributaries of thought happening here. We're delighted that you're with us too. We're inviting you to give us a call, 800-585-9396. It's 800 585 9396. It's the way that you can join us live here on Women of Grace Live if you're in North America. Outside of North America, it's country code 1205 271 Two nine eight five. That is country code one two zero five two seven one twenty nine eighty five. I was out there on the break, uh, just taking a look at uh, EWTN Radio's Facebook page and YouTube channel, and giving waves to all of you. Michael Morvin out there. He said he was giving waves, and I'm giving waves back. Uh, we're always so happy to hear from you. So just join us any which way that you can. Uh, we've got Mary with us, and she's in Sev- Sever Severville, Tennessee. Boy, did I butcher that name of that city. Hey, Mary, how are you today? Fine, thanks. How do you pronounce the name of your city so I can learn? <laughs> <laughs> Severeville. Severeville. Okay. It's not very severe, though, is it? I mean, people are no. friendly, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Has to be. They're in the South. <laughs> yes. So what's going on, sweetie? Uh, well, I keep remembering the last few days, I, I 
told someone, I know that uh, at least I've heard several times that we read parts of the Bible as historical and parts as um, literature or something, yes. I, you know, mm-hmm. like three different ways, and it just won't come back to my head exactly what I've heard before. Okay. Well, so let's let's just talk about Bible, you know. Uh, Bible really is a, it, it comes from, um, I, I believe it's a Latin word, uh, bibliographia, uh, which is a collection, you know, it's a, right. it's a collection. So it's a library, basically. It's a library of books. And just as we know within any library, uh, whether it be a small one that you have at home or you go to your city library, you know, it's a collection of a lot of different kinds of books that are written for different purposes and in different ways. So within the context of sacred scripture, we have a a representation of that, sort of like a microcosm of that. So we'll have some books that are more historically oriented, like Chronicles, for example. We'll have some books that give us uh, ways to live our life. We see that in some of the uh, uh, books of the Old Testament. Leviticus is is an example of that. We have books that that are allegorical. They're teaching us lessons through through storytelling, which is what an allegory, it, it makes comparison but they're moral stories as well. And we have books there that, that are very poetic. The Psalms would be an example, the Song of Songs, absolute beautiful poetry. Uh, so we have a variety of different types of genres of literature in there. So yeah, so you mentioned two of them. You mentioned the the fact that th- there are some that, you know, uh, are, are, are more oriented towards history and, and some are oriented, you know, I mentioned poetry here. Some are more storytelling, allegorical. Uh, some we're supposed to take as historical fact. Others are teaching us a lesson. So we have to be aware of that. And in most Bibles, at the at the introduction to the book, it's going to give you uh, an insight into what kind of literature this is and, and how it needs to be read. But even within the context of those stories that many people would relegate to allegory or would relegate to a fable of some some kind that's got a moral uh, uh, truth in it, um, there is still history contained. And this is why it's important for us to view sacred scripture through the lens of the Catholic Church, because the Church helps us to understand that. For example, there is an encyclical letter that was written by Pope Pius XII called Humanae generis. And in that particular uh, letter, and he wrote this because of, I think, the, the theory of evolution, Darwin's theory of evolution, and people were very confused. Did Adam and Eve exist? You know, did we descend from apes? What is that all about? And he, he lays out very carefully what it, what it is that we must believe with regard to the creation account. And what he does say is that, yes, there was one man and there was one woman and we all descend from them. So he lays that out for us. So in the midst of a, of a tale, like, was it really a snake in, a, in the tree that talked to Eve? Well, we, we kind of have evidence of the fact that if we look at Revelation, that it probably wasn't a snake. It was more like a, a, a dragon. It's, it's like the dragon that is mentioned in Revelation, but basically it was the evil one, right? So, you know, he, the, these kinds of things are, 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 are factual in some ways, and yet they're teaching us a deep moral lesson in other ways. Now, there's also something to be said about, uh, and I thought you were really headed in this direction when I saw the little squib here on my board. Um, You know, how do we read, how do we read sacred scripture? There's several different levels upon which we can read sacred scripture. One is the literal level. And so we look at that literal level and we see what the words actually tell us. You know, Jesus is walking through Samaria. He arrives at a well. He sees a woman sitting there. And so this is the story. But then there's more that's going on in that beautiful story. I think it's in John 4 of the woman at the well Then meets exactly what's on the text. Uh, what is happening there beneath the surface? What was that all about? Was it that Jesus was really thirsty and he just met up with this woman and he has this conversation with her. No, it isn't really just about that. He is wooing her. He is wooing like a lover woos someone. He is wooing her to himself. He, he wants to invite her to drink the living water. And who is the source of that living water? He is. And so what he's doing is, you know, he's, he's bringing her into knowledge of who he is. So much so that at the end, 
of that that incident in sacred scripture she runs off and she tells everybody else you know let me introduce you to the man who told me everything i want to know and she actually admits to jesus you are sir i perceive that you are a prophet and he goes on and 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 the messiah and and he and he acknowledges all of this so we have that level. So we've got the level where it's just the facts, ma'am, nothing but the facts. Then we've got the <laughs> level where <laughs> we watch and we see what this interaction could be communicating. But then there's still a deeper level to that. It's Jesus talking to you. It's Jesus talking to me. And he's giving us a lesson about his love and his mercy. He's giving us a lesson about how there is no sin that is so great that it cannot be forgiven. Um, There is no person who has committed any kind of horrendous act for whom our Lord does not want to reveal his heart and reveal his love and invite them to taste and see that he indeed is good. So we read that and then then we can even take that a step further, Mary. And this is this is so beautiful. We take it into into prayer time. We ponder that story. And we ask the Lord, what are you saying to me specifically in this moment, Lord? What, what, what needs to be revealed in me in the light of your truth that I may, might make repentance and, and come back to you? Uh, you know, what, Lord, what are you saying to me specifically? And we, we stop and we listen and way down deep in the bottom of our heart where St. Francis de Sales says, we hear the voice of God. We hear this beautiful divine communication that can come to us in the form of images. It can come to us in the form of words that seem to play in our mind. It it can come to us on the breath of the Holy Spirit that just breathes it into us. And we're forever transformed by that moment. So sacred scripture, you know, it 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 is especially used in prayer. It's the backbone of our spiritual life. It informs us on so many levels. So I hope that helps you today. If I may, what brought this up was the story of the loaves and the fishes, and I was telling someone, I didn't know how to explain that, you know, how we should interpret that, that it just really, uh, were there really five fishes or whatever, you know the story. Sure. Well, (laughs) yes, and let me tell you about that story, Mary. This is what the church says. Yes, that really took place. Okay? Yes, there was a multiplication of the loaves and the fishes. That is not allegory. That is not there just to teach us a lesson. That is factual. All right? So that's historical. But remember... All things are inspired. Everything in sacred scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, the evangelists or the writers of old Moses, uh, you know, gave us um, the, the, the uh, early books of, of sacred scripture. It doesn't mean that they, when there was a trance or, you know, they were lifted up, it, it, that isn't the kind of, of um, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That, that happens. It means that they sat down to write an account and the Holy Spirit brought into their minds that which they needed to uh, develop and write and that he was there guiding them in that process. And lots of people um, who write can, can attest to that fact that sometimes little thoughts just come into your mind and you say, where did that come from? Well, we know where it comes from when you're doing a work for the Lord. It comes from the Holy Spirit. So that's the kind of, of inspiration they received. But we know that everything in sacred scripture has been accepted by the church. All of the books, the church made that decision, what should be in the canon, what should be in the official uh, Bible, right? So it's all there by means of the Holy Spirit, and all of it uh, it approaches us on several levels. When we look at that particular uh, um, moment in, 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 in historical time that took place when Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fishes, there is that sense, wow, isn't that cool? I mean, he took five loaves and, or, or five fish and 12 loaves and wow, he fed the, fed the multitude so much so that they could pick up, you know, uh, uh, the remains of that, you know, the remnants of that and put them into baskets. Wow, God is so good. That is so cool. Wish I would have been there that day. Wish I could have seen that happen, you know. Uh, But there's a deeper meaning. It's really a foreshadowing, if you will. And what is it foreshadowing? It's foreshadowing the Eucharist, which is why we often read that passage on Eucharistic feasts or at a time of the year where we're celebrating a Eucharistic moment. Um, You know, so it's, it's foreshadowing that this Jesus 
who was able to change or, or to take those 12 loaves and, and those five fish, and he was able to multiply them to feed the masses, has the capacity now through the priest, through ordination, who is in persona Christi to multiply, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> the, the, you know, or to cause to be affected, better stated, cause to be affected this transformation of bread and wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all of us who approach that holy altar, all of us who come to that banquet table, uh, all of us that come to that place of sacrifice, meet Jesus are able to receive him body, blood, soul, and divinity individually. So it's pointing in a certain way to something that's going to come in the future to help us understand how that is possible. Okay? Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bit much. <laughs> I, well, I believe it. It's just trying to repeat it as kind of um, yeah, a challenge. Yeah. Well, it, it, the, the, the basic question there is in is your question did this actually happen and the answer to that is yes but why well it was to feed the multitudes and our lord still feeds the multitudes how through the presence of his body blood soul and divinity in the sacred host and the precious blood that are available to us each one of us in a state of grace every single day of the year there you have it how's that a little more Thank succinct. You very much. <laughs> You're welcome, darling. God bless you now. Well, you know, I'm a book maven here. You know, I love books. So I want to recommend for any of you that want to get a very good understanding of Catholic teaching in relation to sacred scripture, I want to encourage you to look into the Navarre Bible. That's N A V A R R E, N A V A R R E, the Navarre Bible. And it will give you, it's a commentary, it comes in volumes, it's a commentary on how the church looks at and what the church teaches us about uh, sacred scripture, you know, through uh, all of the passages that are there. And it tells us, this is what it's setting up, this is where it relates to the Old Testament. It's a marvelous way to discover deeper truths in sacred scripture and it just encourages our love for sacred scripture. Well, here we are, and we've got people giving us a call. You can call us too, 800-585-9396. That's 800-585-9396. It's the way you can join us live here on Women of Grace Live if you're in North America. Outside of North America, country code 1, 205 271 2985. I'm Johnette Bankovic. Delighted to be with you today. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Share with us your questions, your comments, your insights, your inspirations, because we love, love, love to have holy conversation with you. Go into that break, and we are going to be right back, inviting you to stay tuned to us. Hello, friends. The message of Our Lady of Fatima is more relevant today than ever before. I'm Father Wade Menezes of the Fathers of Mercy, and I look forward to joining Johnette Bankovic as we unpack the mystery of this important prophecy. Join us at the upcoming Women of Grace retreat themed Our Lady of Fatima and the Triumph. How will the battle be won? Being held at Malvern Retreat House July 7th through 9th. Visit womenofgrace.com or call 1-800-558-5452 for details. Living the Beatitudes with Father Bjorn. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. St. Jose Maria Escriva says that we are called to light up the pathways of this earth by being sowers of peace and joy. This comes from being aware that we are sons and daughters of God. On the road of life, though, we find dangers, but God walks with us every step of our life, pouring out the gifts of His Holy Spirit upon us. Our Lady is our companion, like GPS in our car, connected to the cloud and bringing the latest updates to help us navigate our journey and get out of traffic on the way to the eternal kingdom. We don't want to get into family fights on our way to God's vacation destination, but we should be these sowers of peace and joy. We shouldn't accept substitutes, accept only the authentic identity of being his children, his sons and daughters. 
Let's grow in happiness and bring peace to those around us. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. EWTN. Live truth. Live Catholic. Don't miss EWTN's live coverage of the Convocation of Catholic Leaders, hosted by Johnette Binkovic and Dr. Jonathan Reyes, July 1st through the 4th in Orlando, Florida. Catholic leaders from across the country will gather to identify the challenges our church faces in today's culture and work together to develop solutions. The Convocation of Catholic Leaders, beginning Saturday, July 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern, here on EWTN. Welcome back, friends. You're listening to Women of Grace Live. I'm Janet Benkovic, and I'm very happy to be with you today. Certainly am. Do enjoy spending this time with you Monday through Saturday. We invite you to call us with your questions, your comments, your insights, your inspirations. We certainly do. We've been giving you those numbers uh, throughout the course of our program. But I do want to remind you, you can text us too. And the way that you text EWTN is to 55000. Put your name in, and then put your question or comment up there. It comes up right here on our screen. Normal texting uh, costs will apply, however, so we want you to be aware of that. But, you know, we really do invite you to join us today right here. Uh, I'm sure there's something going on in your life today that would be helpful and instrumental in the life of somebody else. Uh, I do want to just uh, comment on a question that came in to me. Let's see if I can find this now. No, oh dear, what happened here? Uh, we had Diane San Pedro with us via Facebook, and she was talking about uh, someone who uh, walked away from the faith, uh, became a Jehovah Witness, receives communion once a year through Jehovah Witnesses, uh, and she was explaining to him the difference between that and Holy Eucharist. And I think it bears repeating here a little bit too. Uh, you know, in order for uh, communion to us is not a sign and it's not a symbol. All right. It isn't a sign. It's not a symbol. In many of the Protestant denominations, now Jehovah Witness is not a Protestant denomination, a denomination from Catholicism. That's what the word denomination means. So Catholicism is not a denomination. Catholicism is Christianity. The Protestant denominations denominated from that, you know, denomination, uh, breaking away from, lower forms of, broke away from that. Jehovah Witnesses, uh, the, the Jehovah Witness uh, belief system and all that it tends to it is really a cult, C-U-L-T. It's a cult. So I want to mention that. But nonetheless, many of uh, Protestant denominations and these cults will receive something that they call Holy Communion but they see it as a sign and a symbol. We as Catholics do not see Eucharist as a sign and as a symbol. It isn't a sign of what Jesus did. It's not a, it's not, you know, a a memory of what Jesus did in the sense that we recall some past event. Uh, It isn't, it isn't a symbol of God's love for us. Uh, It isn't any of those things. When the priest who has received holy orders in persona Christi, pronounces the words of consecration at the holy sacrifice of the Mass, that piece of of bread, that wine, becomes the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not a sign of what Jesus did, not something to spark our memory about the Last Supper, not a symbol of God's love, but it becomes the body, the blood, the soul, the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we don't look at this in the same way as those who have broken away from Catholicism look at it, or those who have strayed so far as to invite themselves into cults, We know what this is, and we know it by what our Lord told us at the Last Supper. When he said to the apostles, do this in remembrance of me, we have to understand what the word remembrance means to the Jew. Now, remembrance in the Jewish context is not about something that we we look to that's in the past, a past event 
or something that occurred a long time ago and we say, oh, isn't that nice? Do you remember, you know, I read in sacred scripture, gee, you know, that was lovely. It happened in time and I can think about that now, uh, but it, 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 it isn't anything that's really applicable to today. That isn't the Jewish understanding of remembrance. The Jewish understanding of remembrance is to make the past present again. Let me say that. The Jewish understanding of the word remembrance is to make the past, that which happened in the past, present again. No longer something that's blocked off to us because of the passage of time, but something that happened in time and exists in the eternal moment and therefore can be experienced in the present moment. I know this is a big concept. I get it. We've got to start thinking not in Kronos time, the time of clocks, but in Kairos time, the time of Christ. All right? Kairos time, Christ. Kronos time, clocks. All right? So when it comes to the actions of our Lord Jesus Christ, whether it is the, the, the gift of Eucharist that happened at the Last Supper, whether it is a miracle that he performed, the multiplication of the loaves and the fish, as we talked about earlier, whether it's the healing of the blind man, that action exists in the eternal moment because it is Christ's time. It's the eternal dimension intersecting time that now exists in that eternal moment and is immediately available to us. That comes to us from the Jewish understanding of remembrance. For the Jew, when they celebrate the Passover, it isn't a recollection of what once was. It isn't just a tradition that we do. It isn't a nice thing. It is making the past present again. And all of that mercy of God, all of that grace of God exists in the now moment. Very hard concept. It's a mystery. So we're never going to completely understand it. I think we'll have an opportunity to perceive it more deeply than we ever could hear when we're in heaven. I think God wants to crack these mysteries open, but we're so imperfect now, our minds can't hold the fullness of God right now, but they're going to grow under that. The more we love God, the more you know our hearts are dilated, we contain more of him, and the more that that has an effect on our capacity to understand, the more that it, uh, that it affects our emotions, our intellect, our reasoning capacity, it intellects our, our imagination. And the more we, we through this, this marvelous, marvelous reality of the Holy Spirit, can enter into this, this eternal moment, we can taste it here. Sometimes it's, it's almost as if just a gossamer, you know, the, the slightest little bit of fabric, you know, so, so, so much like a cobweb. It's just something that, 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 that we can actually begin to see through and begin to experience very deeply within, but, but nonetheless, never fully here. We accept it on faith. And so we have those beautiful hymns of St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, that talk with us about, uh, you know, about the Eucharist. Oh, Father God, I pray right this very moment that you would inspire the hearts and the minds of all of those who are in charge of liturgical music within our parishes, within our dioceses, to make a return to sacred music, to music that, that teaches us even as we sing it, so that it can indeed become true prayer, not just something that emotionally hits us, but something that, that affects a change in our heart, in our soul, something that brings grace to us, something that, that helps for us to be informed and catechized. I pray for this. Anyway, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for that impromptu prayer that just welled up inside of me. Anyway, huh, well, we return to the present moment here, right? Um, and so the fact of the matter is when you're talking about this, Diana, this person never really understood Eucharist. And maybe now that you understand it a little bit better, or maybe I've, I've, I've added something to, to your knowledge or, or, or your life of faith through it, well, then you can take that to him now. Now, there was another part of your question in there that had it had something to do with people living with each other and they're not married. Does it really matter? Yes, it does. Cohabitating with anybody. 
<laughs> is not of God, <laughs> unless it's a person of the same sex with whom you have a very chaste relationship, okay? <laughs> you know, we're not to live with other individuals of the opposite sex. We're not to live as man and wife outside of the sacrament of matrimony. I'm not saying that we can't fall, that we're not sorely tempted, and sometimes temptation is given into, but we repent and we change our ways, right? We move out of that situation. And the fact that this person wasn't married civilly has not, or wasn't married in the church has nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. Uh, if that person has not received an annulment, even an annulment of form, you know, then then it's an adulterous relationship. It's a fornicating relationship. So there you have that end of your question. Well, let's get back to the phone line. See, uh, we want you to join us here. Let me give you those numbers again. 800 800- 585-9396. That's 800-585-9396. If you're outside of North America, your number, country code 1-205-271-2985. That is country code 1-205-271-2985. Uh, just taking a little wee look out here uh, on Facebook uh, and, and uh, YouTube channels, we have people with us from Kuwait today, from Zambia today. We have somebody with us from Dublin. We have Sebastian So from Singapore today. It's always wonderful to have all of you with us. And I want you to know you can call us with your questions and comments as well as posting them here. And those numbers, again, if you're outside of North America, country code 1-205-271-2985. Country code 1-205-271-2985. If you're in North America, again, 800 800- 585-9396. Our call screener today, Matt Gabinski, our producer, Tom Gray. We're grateful for Rich Jesse, who's there with us on uh, our social media. And uh, we're grateful for all of you for listening. Wanted to read something to you. I shared with you yesterday, you know, about purchasing these books at this library sale up there at Orchard Lake Schools. I had such fun. Have to admit to you something, though. I did call one of the students and ask her to get me another book that I saw on the shelf. Oh, my goodness sakes. You know, ah, gee, I pray about it. Lord, do I have too much of an attachment to books? And I'm pretty positive I do. So I've got to work on that. Um, Just not right at this moment, because I want to read you something really fabulous from one of the books that I picked up. And we say, well, you know, how is it then that I grow in this knowledge of God? How is it that that, that I, I I I continue to move forward in my life of faith. And it all has to do with a four-letter word. And it begins with L. Can you guess what it is? Four-letter word begins with L. (laughs) You know, very tempted to do charades here. (laughs) It's love. Love, love, love. And it isn't the emotion of love, and it's not the passion of love. It's the action of love. It is loving God. And Jesus tells us how to love him. He tells us to love him by loving one another, to love others as we love ourselves. That's kind of a twofold insight, isn't it? We've got to learn how to love ourselves, and we have to love others as well, as if they were another self. And the only way we can do that is through the love of God welling up within us. He's the one who gives us patience with others, but I'm finding more and more, he gives me patience with myself, (laughs) you know? putting up with my foible, saying, I'm not perfect yet, but I sure am trying, right? I'm sure working towards it. That's what I say about Maggie May, my little puppy. People say she's so cute. And I say, yeah, she's perfect. And when she isn't, she wants to be, right? So in some ways, you know, we're we're attaining virtue. We're growing in perfection. In other ways, you know, we're not there yet, but we want to be. So we start to exercise that virtue. Very practical lesson there. But here's a, here's a comment in this beautiful book that I picked up um, up there at the library on uh, the property of Orchard Lake Schools, Discourses on Our Lady by Father O. Rafferty. And he says this, he says, no mind can ever conceive nor tongue describe the fire of love toward God that continually burned in Mary's heart. And see, I want to tell you, this is another really good tip here. If you know that you need to love God more, and let's face it, none of us love him sufficiently. We don't. I don't care how much you love him. It isn't sufficient. He loves us under perfection. He loves us under infinitude. And since we're not perfect, (laughs) and we have not the capacity to contain infinitude in us yet, we really don't love him enough. And I find that when I ask Our Lady, Mother, you loved God to perfection, 
You know, you did. You were perfect. I'm not. So mother, help me to grow in love of God. Help me to love him more. I like to pray this too. Jesus, help me to love your mother more. Mother, help me to love Jesus more, your son. Right? Beautiful thing. And guess what? Our lady does that. So we can never love God as much as our lady loves God in our temporal state right? Maybe something else will happen in heaven. I don't know. I can't wait to get there and find out. So he goes on and he says, St. Teresa of Avila was called a seraph of love because of her ardent charity. But if all the rational creatures of the earth were so many seraphim of love, and if all their love were put together, it would not equal that of Mary. Mary's love for God surpassed that of all the saints who ever lived upon this earth. Indeed, as St. Bernardin asserts, it surpassed that of all the angels of heaven. As soon as Mary was conceived in her mother's womb and acquired the knowledge of God and of the extraordinary graces with which she enriched her from the instant of her immaculate conception, she directed the first dart of her love to God. I love that. I love that kind of phraseology. And from that moment, she never ceased to love him with her whole heart, with her whole soul, with her whole mind, and with her whole strength. As she advanced in age and grace and virtue, oh, where is that a throwback to? What does that remind you of? Does it remind you of when Mary or when Jesus was lost in the temple and Mary and Joseph approached? And do you remember that scene? And Mary says, "Son, you know, what if what your father and I were very worried about you? Why have you done this?" And he says, "Did you not know I must be about my father's business?" And we never find out what goes on in that moment, but I think our lady just looked at her son and he said, "Oh, you mean to tell me this isn't God's time for me? This isn't my father's time for me? <laughs> and of course, that would have been what she was communicating. We know that because in Cana, she does tell him, no, now's the time. He says, hey, woman, what does this have to do with me and you, the fact that they have no wine? And she just looks at him. She looks at the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. And he knows full well. And he communicates to her, you know what this means. If I start to do this, 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 you know, I work this miracle then it's going to get me to Golgotha. It's going to get me to the ultimate sacrifice. And she says, do whatever he tells you. And Jesus turns the water into wine. She tells him about his mission, when it is and when it isn't. But then after that, when he's lost in the temple, do you remember the next line in John? What it says there? It says, he returned to Nazareth with his mother and his father, and he was obedient in all things, and he grew in wisdom, age, and grace. A little teaching there. If you want to grow in wisdom, age, and grace, and here now I'm talking about spiritual age, if you want to grow in that way, it begins with a preliminary, primary, most important virtue, obedience. And what does obedience flow from? The queen of all virtues, humility. So here, you know, Father O'Rafferty, what is he saying about Our Lady? Just tickles me to no end. Just tickles me. Absolutely tickles me. It says this, as soon as Mary was conceived in her mother's womb and acquired this knowledge, you know, of God, her first dart of love goes towards God. And then he says, as she advanced in age and grace and virtue, clearly a reference back to Jesus, right? So she's growing under her son. Oh, so good. As she advanced in age and grace and virtue, her love of God increased in proportion. It increased in proportion. Is that good? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) I love it. So we have to grow in wisdom, age, and grace. And we do it the way Jesus did it, through obedience, which is an indication of of total humility to the word of God and the things of God and his will. So to the extent that we we don't do that, to that extent, what happens? We prohibit, we prohibit ourselves from receiving the fullness of love that God wants to uh, entrust to us, that's meant to take up residence within our heart, that our hearts might swell with his love, be dilated by his love and contain more of him. And then we, like our lady, grow right? We grow in wisdom, age, and grace under the Lord. That's how we do it. That, that, that's it. That, that, that is it in a nutshell. That's the spiritual life. So this is why we try to root out of ourselves, you know, all of those sins that are leading us away from God. This is why we don't make a friend of cohabitation with somebody of the opposite sex and live as if we're husband and wife when we're not. 
You know, it's why we don't have premarital sex. And when we do, we pick ourselves up and we rush to the sacrament, right? I mean, it's, it's why we repent of all of the ways in which we hold on to lack of forgiveness. It's, it's what sends us into the confessional over, over sins of omission. It's all of those things, right? And, and I use those examples because they're common, to mankind. Yesterday I heard Father Mitch um, on, on his open line radio show, which was taking place at the Benedicta Leadership Institute up there. I, I, I heard him talking about the fact that, um, uh, you know, get, you know, the sins of the flesh, he says, those are the number one sins. When it sins of passion, it's that one, right? So, you know, we, 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 we take ourselves out of situations we ought not to be in so that we're not sorely tempted because we'll give in to temptation sooner or later. We're weak. Uh, Anyway, it says she advanced in age and grace and virtue. Her love of God increased in proportion. And then he goes on and he says this. Yes, Mary loved God not only by frequent acts of charity as the saints did, but by one great continuous act of love, which was her life. Isn't that beautiful? Mary's entire life was love of God. Now, this gives me a whole lot to examine my conscience about today. I don't know about you, but it gives me a whole lot. Well, let's get to these phone lines. I've been chit-chatting away here. I apologize. Catherine, Syracuse, New York, listening to us via Station of the Cross. Catherine, how are you, honey? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. So what's going on in your life? Um, Well, basically... um I am in recovery from mm-hmm. an addiction uh, problem yes, that had dear. been going on for many years. And, um, you know, I went to the rooms of, you know, um, 12-step programs and into <laughs> rehabs and, you know, name it, I tried it. And yes. I, I couldn't stop, um, you know, using a substance. Okay. And it was like there was a hole in my soul that, that I couldn't fill, and um, what I found is uh, the missing puzzle piece, you know, as some may say, was God, yes. and um, and as soon as I, I reached out my hand to God and, and grabbed a hold of God, um, who had been waiting there all along, <laughs> uh, you know, there that was lifted, the obsession was lifted off of me, and um and, I, and I'm just so grateful. And so really what I wanted to ask is I feel that um, that uh, God's telling me to um, to bring people to him, to maybe get into uh, a practice uh, spiritually based to help with, like, healing and, um, and, to, and to bring people to God. And um, so I just wanted to know if, you know, you think that that is a good idea. Well, Catherine, I want to tell you, I absolutely congratulate you. I am, I am so proud of you, and I'm so happy for you that you are in recovery, that you're remaining true to this recovery, that you're cooperating with Grace every day to help keep you in recovery. And I do want to recommend that, you know, support groups can be very helpful in keeping us along that path. And I always try to recommend that you find a recovery group that holds on to the same truths of the faith that you are on to, right? I want for you to try to find uh, good Catholic friends who are in recovery, uh, where the, the faith and this life of God means everything to them. You are right. Without God in the, ce- uh, in the center of our life, it is very hard to remain, to remain in recovery. And for you to share your travail with others, to help others come to this place, that in and of itself will help to hold you in recovery. I think it's a brilliant idea. It's a scriptural idea. You go out there and you read uh, 1 Corinthians right there. I think it's in chapter 1. St. Paul talks about that. It is a holy thing to do. And if you feel that you are strong enough to do that, always realizing that you need people that are supporting you in prayer and that you're seeking that support, then I say go for it. But it would be good to have someone else who is in, is strong in recovery to go with you. So-